Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome again to St. John's Riverside Hospital's webinar series. Uh, today's topic, conversation with our breast specialists. Uh, before we begin and before I introduce our speakers, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my team who puts these programs together. That's Jason Latore, who is our producer, Nancy Anabi, our community liaison, and Candace Cousins Hopkins, who is our Associate Director of External Affairs. They do a great job and I'm very grateful for them. Uh, also, our community partners who actually help us get the word out and get, uh, you know, attendees from all over the city. Uh, Sally Pinto is from the Yonkers Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community under the umbrella of the Yonkers Office for the Aging and Westchester Jewish Community Services. And Z Barrett is from the Yonkers Public Library, uh, which has three locations, Riverfront, Will, and Crestwood. And now I'd like to take a moment and introduce both of our um, our speakers today. Uh, they do have some amazing credentials, so I do want to take a moment and actually give you their their bio. So Dr. Maureen McAvoy is a breast surgeon at Montefiore and St. John's Riverside Hospital and is an assistant professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She is also the program director of the Breast Surgery Fellowship. Since 2015, Dr. McAvoy has been devoted solely to caring for women and men with breast cancer. Her clinical focus is on minimally invasive and oncoplastic techniques to achieve cosmetically acceptable outcomes while treating breast cancer surgically. Additionally, she educates patients about their diagnoses and helps them explore treatment options. She attended Albert Einstein College of Medicine, received her Doctor of Medicine in 2007, her postgraduate training began in 2007 at Albert Einstein College of Medicine with a surgical residency, which she completed in 2014. In 2011, she completed a clinical research fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Her training continued at Massachusetts General Hospital in 2014 with a year-long fellowship in breast surgical oncology. Young women with breast cancer and the prevention of lymphedema have been the main focuses of interest in Dr. McAvoy's research. And I really wanted to give that some gravitas because I think your credentials are, are wonderful and we're so thrilled to have you in our local community. Um, also, Laura Grafland, uh, who is a, I think it's, <laughs> It's a DNP, is doctor, a nurse practitioner, which I just love that, uh, is a clinical nurse practitioner in breast surgery and an assistant professor of nursing at Columbia University School of Nursing. In 2013, she started her career as a bedside nurse and Laura joined Columbia University in 2016, shifting her focus to breast oncology. Until 2018, she conducted clinical research trials for novel breast cancer therapies, after which she began treating women and men with breast cancer as a nurse practitioner. Um, in an outpatient medical oncology setting until she accepted her current position with Symphony Medical in partnership with St. John's Riverside Hospital and Montefiore Surgical Group. She achieved her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Messiah University in 2013, followed by her Master's in Nursing and her Clinical Doctorate of Nursing Practice from Columbia University. Since obtaining her terminal degree, she received the Faculty Award for Excellence in a subspecialty, has published in the Journal for Nurse Practitioners, and has presented at various conferences. And so you can see from both of these extraordinary women that they are absolute underachievers. Uh, so we are just thrilled to have you both with us uh, and and we're gonna we have questions that we have prepared. We actually have been asking um, audience members to uh, send in, and we do have a, a question that I will save to the end uh, that has come in from our audience already. And anything else that I get from the audience, I will hold and ask at the end. By the way, I should also say that this uh, recording will show up on our Facebook and, and uh, other social media platforms, uh, usually at the end of the day, and so that the audience can share it with anyone who was unable to be with us today. Okay, so let's just start, uh, and this is a question for either one of you, uh, and welcome again, both of you. Um, let's start right at the beginning. When should someone start screening for breast cancer? Great. Well, thank you, Denise, and thank you for inviting us to uh, do this. We love October and being able to sort of highlight what we do. And also, um, you know, we have the ability to uh, detect breast cancer at an early stage where it's curable. So this is a great opportunity. So um, in terms of uh, when patients should start screening mammograms, 
Um, there are different guidelines out there. The guidelines that we uh, follow suggest doing screening mammograms starting at the age of 40 um, for patients who you know, have a stronger family history or may have you know, a reason that makes them high risk, they would start earlier. But the uh, average woman should start screening mammograms at the age of 40 and continue them every year. Okay, so you, you use the word screening ma mammogram. What is the difference between a screening mammogram and a diagnostic mammogram? A screening mammogram takes uh, two views similar to you know, a chest x-ray. So they uh, put your breast in compression. They do one view looking uh, from head to toe and one view coming in from the side. And you need both of those views to be able to have a better um, spatial orientation if you see something abnormal. A diagnostic mammogram also adds an oblique view, so it's going coming in at an angle. And in addition, if there's something that the radiologist uh, is concerned about, or even the patient points out and says something uh, is uncomfortable and I feel something in this area, they can do what's called a spot compression. So they can look specifically at that one site with the uh, mammogram and really um, almost like zoom into that spot. So a diagnostic is needed for a more detailed look than a screening mammogram. Okay, so that would be like a second step. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All patients would start just with a screener and those who need something additional get a diagnostic. Okay, so, you know, there's so much, especially this month, we're celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we do a lot of stuff here and for our community and for our employees. And uh, and we talk about it. We send out information. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there about being high risk. What does that mean? Who qualifies as high risk? How would you know? So high risk uh, can be thought up in many different ways. I think it's important to know your family history. So if you have a family history, meaning a first degree relative, so mother or sister uh, um, or even a brother who has a personal history of breast cancer, that is very significant and that puts you in a high risk category. Um, sometimes your background, such as uh, patients who are Ashkenazi uh, Jewish, that actually also puts you in a high risk category. And lastly, patients who have had previous breast biopsies that showed an abnormality, such as words like atypia or lobular carcinoma in situ, those uh, put you in a high risk category. Um, so those are things that can be determined just by having a conversation with you know, your family or then knowing your risk based on previous bi biopsies you've had. Okay, so high risk, let's say someone thinks they're high risk, should someone then consider to get high risk genetic testing? And can someone explain, you know, what's involved with doing that testing? Sure, yeah, I'll jump in and answer this one, Denise. Hi, Laura. Uh, hi, so, uh yeah, you know, if if you think you might be high risk or you've spoken to a provider and together based on your personal history or your family history, your ancestry that you are considered high risk, um, it is good to consider getting genetic testing. Of course, that's um, a conversation that you have with a breast specialist or a genetic counselor before doing it to discuss the pros and cons of genetic testing. Um, but if if you decide you do want to go through with genetic testing, the test is pretty simple, actually. It's either one small tube of blood that you can give or one small tube of saliva, depending on the kit available. And there's several different panels that we may use um, in breast cancer susceptibility genes. So it's either seven or 47 genes typically that we look at. And once we get the results, which takes anywhere between two and four weeks, uh, we discuss them and decide if there are, if there's anything actionable, if there's anything that we can do to help reduce your risk by depending on what those findings are. OK, well, that sounds very simple, but, you know, I'm going to ask a hard question and you may not know the answer to this because this is not your thing, both of you. But there was a time when genetic testing was talked about a lot, but but was not covered by insurance. If you are deemed to be high risk or, or potentially high risk, are those tests now covered? Do you know? And if you don't, then I'm going to find out, make sure that our audience knows. 
It depends on your insurance, your individual insurance plan. I am finding now that most of the time we can get coverage if you're meeting the guidelines uh, that that uh, allow for genetic testing, which are pretty extensive now. There's pretty clear guidelines about who the NCCN feels should get genetic testing. And if you meet those criteria, most of the time uh, it is covered by insurance. Uh, there are companies that we utilize that also provide assistance with coverage if your insurance doesn't. Um, but we do work together with our patients to find an affordable way to get this information. So the panel comes back. Thank you for that. That's that's good to know. Um, the panel comes back and you see that there are some genetic issues. Now, the, the little that I know uh, have to do with the, the, the BRCA genes. Um, but I, it, there may be other genes. So what happens at that point in, in that discussion? What, what's your process? Sure, so I mean, either of us can answer it. So if you, if you come back showing a genetic mutation and we can focus just on BRCA1 and 2, um, that increases your risk um, significantly for breast cancer. So if that's found out before you even have a breast cancer diagnosis, then we can have a discussion of um, whether you want to be watched closely under surveillance, and that would include a six-month clinical breast exam um, at our office by either myself or uh, Laura, and adding, in addition to your annual mammogram, adding an ultrasound and an MRI. There is also the option of surgical intervention for patients who have a, a mutation and um, you can do prophylactic surgery. So prior to developing a breast cancer, some patients um, want to actually remove both of their breasts and do a bilateral mastectomy. That's a very personal choice. Um, and I don't find that the first time you get your testing results back that that's the decision you want to make. Um, and sometimes you go through you know, one or two years of screening and after you may have had a, a scare and perhaps they see something and you're called back for a biopsy, which can be quite um, stressful, then sometimes patients decide to remove uh, their breasts and we can offer many different ways to do that and reconstructive options. Um, so the patients should feel as though they, they have options there with that surgical choice too. So in that, in just following that line of thought in, in the, um in the reconstruction part, because I do know people who have elected to do the prophylactic mastectomies, um, and some have not had immediate reconstruction, but immediate reconstruction does exist. Exactly. So um, there's you know different types of mastectomies. You can do one without reconstruction at all, and whether you um, choose to go flat, as people say, and you know just. Uh, not have anything is totally a personal choice and it's actually we're seeing a big trend towards that um, which I think is great and being comfortable with you know who you are um, and there's also the option of wearing a prosthetic bra which can be fitted specifically for you um, if you do choose to have reconstruction we can um, do everything to you know keep you on an outward appearance looking like yourself so such as saving your skin saving your areola and saving your nipple we can hide the incision uh, all the way at the bottom. And at the time of your surgery, the plastic surgeon is there with myself and we work together to rebuild the breast, whether we put in an implant or use um, fat from elsewhere in the body, such as your belly um, and rebuild the breast with natural tissue. Very interesting. Okay, um, so I just wanted to take a step back and we were talking about the mammograms before and the difference between screening and diagnostic, but I know um, even for someone like myself, I've always had my mammography and I've always gotten an ultrasound and I sort of just went along for the ride. I just didn't realize, really know why I needed to have both of those. So what's the difference in those two exams and why would you need both? Sure, sure. So I know Dr. McAvoy already reviewed a little bit about how uh, the mammogram works. And, uh, you know, just to build on that a little bit, we also talk about these 3D uh, mammos, which is a more advanced technology uh, with mammography, still use very, very low dose X-ray technology. They're just taking additional uh, pictures as well to sort of formulate a 3D image of the breast. Um, and it's a much clearer image compared to a 2D mammo. 
And then an ultrasound works a little bit differently. Um, they use a wand on the outside of the breast. There's uh, no X-ray involved. They use sound waves actually to produce a picture of the internal structures of the of the breast and they can actually help further differentiate anything that they might see in the breast. And there's several reasons why somebody might have both. Uh, specific to screening, that's usually when uh, a person has dense breast tissue. So when we talk about breast tissue, we have three major types. We have glandular tissue, fibrous connective tissue, and fatty tissue. And when we say you have dense breasts, it means that that fibrous and glandular tissue is more than the fatty tissue. And that can actually make it a little bit harder to find abnormalities in the breast with mammography alone. So we sort of take uh, two different types of imaging so that they can work together and make it a little bit more likely um, for us to have early detection if there is something abnormal in the breast. Very interesting. And I should point out that St. John's does have 3D mammography. I just wanted to make sure that our audience knew that. Um, OK, so uh, speaking of, of these technologies, are there new technologies related to, to the mammograms? Yeah, so I think, uh, like Laura said, you know, 3D mammogram is really becoming um, you know, the standard of care. Um, most centers have it. Um, if your center doesn't have it and you go for a mammogram, definitely be sure to ask if they have a 3D option. And if they don't, then you should, um, I, I think it really is beneficial to get that done. Um, there are definitely different you know, screening techniques that are out there, but in terms of you know, what the standard of care is and what's been actually proven to diagnose breast cancer at an early stage, screening mammogram is, uh, is what you should be doing. OK, um, I, I know that there is now something that we're actually going to be getting here. Um, they're curved plates for the mammography suite for the for the machine itself, which should um, make it a little bit more comfortable um, in the squeeze. Sure. So uh, we're very excited about getting those and I just thought I'd put that out there. Um, we can't wait to, to have that here. So let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that both of you have office hours in our outpatient facility, which is located in the Boyce Thompson Center, Executive Boulevard in North Broadway. Um, when a patient comes to your office, usually it's with a referral. Can you walk um, me and our audience through the process of what happens when they come see you and, and how you handle things? Sure. So I think no matter who you are and where you come from, you can definitely be, um, you know, expect to be greeted in a kind and warm environment. And each patient here is treated as a unique individual, both themselves and their family. Uh, Dr. McAvoy and I work as a close-knit team, so depending on the reason for your visit, you might see one, either one or both of us at your initial visit. Um, but no matter who you see, you can expect to have enough time with the provider to have all of your questions answered before you leave. Um, we take a, a multidisciplinary approach to cancer treatment as well. So. We work together with radiology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, et cetera, just to create a personalized treatment plan for each individual, because uh, no two people should be treated the same. If surgery is required uh, for you as an individual, we do set aside adequate one-on-one -on -one time with a patient and their family to walk through education, uh, how to care for yourself both before and after your surgery so that you know exactly what to expect. Uh, also, you know, many times there might be additional imaging or other diagnostics that might be required. And if that's true for you, we do work together with our radiology um, patient navigator, Sherry Rosenberg, who's been excellent with helping us get appointments quickly. And that's something so beautiful about a community setting is that we all know each other and we can uh, get patients in quickly. Um, so it's really a team effort. You can expect a team effort from the moment you walk in until the moment um, you're done. You know, Dr. McAvoy, you and I spoke last year in the webinar that you did last year about the relationship that you develop. Um, and I kind of wanted to touch back on that because as Laura was talking, I sort of flagged two words um, out of what she said. One was quick, quick. I think um, anyone who has a cancer diagnosis, but I know women in particular like a plan. They, that, that was my second word quick in a plan, but you talked about relationship and I just wanted to sort of touch on that, um, you know, 
the length of time you see a patient, um, what what you how, how you go forward because you you have the initial phase, and then you have surgery, then you have post surgery, then then what? So I think from a patient's point of view or from our audience's point of view, what is the long relationship look like? Sure. So yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about um, being a breast surgeon is you have a long-term relationship with your patients. It's very different than, you know, say general surgery where a patient comes into the emergency room and has appendicitis and you remove the appendix and you see them post-op and you never see them again. So typically the patient um, that we see with breast cancer has been uh, given bad news uh, by their primary care doctor or the radiologist, um, sometimes in person, sometimes over the phone and is given um, a referral to come and see us. So when they come into our office, they are devastated and they have many questions and are really looking for um, answers. So watching that transformation during that initial visit of a patient who comes in and um, is clearly upset as we go through what the diagnosis means, a typical treatment, what to expect, um, seeing them then leave the office after that initial visit with a sense of a plan is, is really wonderful. And I feel like the patients feel some sense of control again in terms of what's going on. We get the patients to a point where they're ready for surgery and take them to surgery, and then we follow them for up to five years after. So I see them a week or two post-op, and then I see them at three months. I see them six months later, um, and then I see them uh, yearly for about five years. Um, and it's great. I mean, patients come back and they're showing me pictures of their children or their grandchildren, and it's almost a social visit at that point. And sometimes I'm, I'm ready to discharge them at five years and say, you know, you're doing great. You really don't need to see me anymore. And they're like, I'm getting my mammogram next year and I'll be right back. And I say, it's fine. <laughs> okay, no problem. But it's, um, it really is a long-term relationship that we, we build with the patients. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think that's very important uh, for our patients to to understand that it's not uh, it's not over once the surgery is over. You know, you're 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 on board for for some time. So we started talking about a, a specific type of of surgery a little bit before, uh, which was the prophylactic mastectomy. But can you talk a little bit about the other treatments that are uh, the other options that are available, both medical and surgical? Sure. So, you know, patients come to us even without a breast cancer diagnosis who need breast surgery, such as they, you know, they had an abnormal biopsy and we need to remove that. And that's, you know, just an open biopsy, basically. So we do that as a same day surgery um, or patients with a palpable mass that's painful or um, growing. We remove that as well. And typically those are non-cancerous. For our cancer patients, um, most patients have the option of saving their breasts. So we do breast conservation surgery where we would just remove the tumor um, and leave the breast as it is. Um, or if there's a really large tumor, and we can work in conjunction with a plastic surgeon. And at the time of me removing the tumor, the plastic surgeon can actually do what's called a breast reduction and help rearrange the tissue to rebuild the breast um, so that it, it doesn't look as though I've taken out a, a large volume of tissue. And on the other side, they typically will then match the breasts if patients are symmetric. Um, and if for whatever reason we can't save the breast and we need to do a mastectomy because perhaps there's more than one tumor in the breast, um, like we talked about, there's different ways to do a mastectomy, whether we do reconstruction or we don't, um, saving the skin, um, attempting to save the nipple, all of the things that we, we really want to do to in the end, leave the patient looking um, as they had originally come to us. So the decisions then on the course of surgery or other treatments really are based on, you know, what you're presented with in terms of what the situation is. So it's very individual. So does staging, is that something that still happens in the case of breast tumors? where you know how aggressive it is or what kind of cancer it is. Can you can you speak to, you know, sort of how that process is? Because I that's something I really don't know very much about. Sure. So in terms of, you know, full body scans, um, we don't always have to do that with a breast cancer. 
Uh, luckily, breast cancer is caught early due to screening mammograms. So if you're caught early, meaning the breast cancer is only located in the breast, it doesn't look like it's any place else like the lymph nodes, you don't typically need full staging, um, like a CAT scan or a bone scan or a PET scan. We would um, evaluate your lymph nodes during surgery. So we can remove one or two specific lymph nodes, and then we would send those for testing. Um, and that's part of the staging process. A patient who has advanced stage when they come to us, meaning their lymph nodes are already known to be involved, those patients we would wanna get staging scans on, like a PET scan, to make sure it's no place else in the body. Okay. Um, there's a question that was submitted and it, it, it has to do with a specific type of, and I think it's, a, it's an aggressive cancer. So I'm just gonna try and ask this question and not sound crazy, but you know, I know personally women who have presented with breast cancer late in their pregnancies. And if someone is presenting with an HER2 triple positive or negative um, cancer, which doesn't have anything necessarily to do with pregnancy, um, is that is that a, a, a cancer that is aggressive and how does the treatment for those things differ but also add on the pregnancy do you wait for the pregnancy to be over do you if it's late in the pregnancy do you try and move that along and get the patient into can you just talk because it seems like it's happening a lot Sure, so that's a great question. And that's why I have to say we're very grateful to have this multidisciplinary team that we work with. Um, you know, in a case like this, we would definitely have the patient involved with medical oncology, um, radiation oncology, uh, ourselves, and even you would need the OBGYN. And as a team, we would individually see the patient, but then talk um, and, and come up with a plan that's safe for the patient. In, you know, a third trimester pregnancy, we typically can get the patient to term to deliver the baby um, so that they have a, have a, you know, a healthy term baby and, it, you know, without really delaying their treatment. So it's safe to go to the operating room um, at, you know, a third trimester. So we would be able to possibly do the surgery, remove the cancer, and then you would wait to deliver the baby uh, before doing adjuvant treatment, such as, you know, chemotherapy or radiation. If it was earlier in the pregnancy, um, say, you know, second trimester, it, it is safe to give chemotherapy during the second trimester. So you could attempt to give chemotherapy during that time and then having the patient deliver and then go on to surgery. So there's, there's a lot of different options, um, but working with a whole team approach to keep both, you know, the patient and the baby uh, safe. Okay. Um, so you talked about the surgical um, options and um, we referenced um, some of the other the medical treatments that are being utilized. Um, but are there is there anything new? Are there trials out there? What's going on out there that we should know about that might be worth knowing about? There's a breast cancer does get a lot of attention and there's constantly a lot of research happening in the breast cancer world. So we do have, you know, a lot of very exciting new treatments in breast cancer, um, you know, could talk about it for a long time. But if, if we want to focus on some more recent exciting developments, we now use immunotherapy in breast cancer, um, both in the curative setting and in the metastatic setting. Um, so a lot of people might have, have heard the advertisements for, for Keytruda, which is the specific immunotherapy that we use in breast cancer now. It can be used in a specific type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And we do use that as uh, pre-surgical or post-surgical um, treatment in stage two and three triple negative breast cancer now. And it has shown in a, a large trial called the Keynote 522 trial uh, to significantly improve the number of stage two and three triple negative breast cancer patients that actually have um, most or all of their cancer gone by the time they've gone to their surgery, um, which is really exciting for this particular area of breast cancer. Uh, they haven't had much new for them in a long time, so it was a very exciting development for them. And we're also finding 
that after they've had all their treatment, they're less likely to have their breast cancer come back uh, after using immunotherapy in this particular setting. Wow, that's exciting. Anything else? Keep telling me more stuff. Yeah, yeah. Also in the metastatic setting specific to triple negative, we have uh, an antibody drug conjugate that was FDA approved in the last five years called Tridelvi. Um, and that's very exciting for the triple negative metastatic setting patients. Uh, they also haven't had anything new for them in a long time. Uh, this is an antibody drug conjugate is a manufactured antibody. It's made in a lab um, and it's chemically bonded to a sort of standard chemotherapy to give more of a local effect. So we give the medication via an IV um, and the manufactured antibody is sort of like a seek and destroy. It finds the cancer cells in the body using a specific marker and injects the chemotherapy directly into the cancer cell as opposed to administering the chemotherapy be all throughout the body, um, which is a sort of standard type of, type of chemotherapy. So um, we're seeing uh, improved overall survival and improved what we call disease-free survival. So a longer time on one individual treatment in the metastatic setting. So also very exciting for this group of triple negative breast cancer patients. That's wonderful. I'm thrilled to hear it. Um, okay, so Depending on the stage that a patient presents, is surgery always warranted? I mean, even the minimally invasive sorts of surgeries, would you, would you, you know, it's funny, I, I'm going to just tell a personal story. My mom had breast cancer and the, we were given the choice. Do you want a lumpectomy or do you want a mastectomy? Now, I sat there, and this is a long time ago, but I sat there and thought, well, am I equipped to make that decision? So at what point do you, as the physician and as the clinical provider, talk through what's real at each stage? Yeah, I would say, you know, at that, at that initial visit, um, I sort of have to gauge how much the patient's taking in, right? So sometimes, you know, I, I'm giving um, details about what it means to have breast cancer and what a typical treatment will look like. And um, if the patients are, are you know, clearly comprehending that and moving forward with um, making decisions that day, then we can get it, we can have that conversation that day. Some patients, you can tell, this is not a day we're making any decisions. And I tell them that we we still might, you know, take some time and get additional imaging and then I can bring them back and then we can really make, make a decision. Um, every stage is operable except for stage four, which is when it's spread beyond the breast. Um, an axilla, once it's any place else in the body, liver, lung, brain, we can't operate. Um, and those patients we do have, like Laura just touched on, um, uh, you know, therapies for them. But patients who have um, disease in the breast or disease in the breast and under the arm in the axilla are surgical candidates. And in terms of the option of mastectomy or breast conservation, um, typically over 70% of patients can have breast conservation. You can do a lumpectomy. Um, but with a lumpectomy, you have to have radiation. And so radiation is not, um, is, is very inconvenient. It's a daily treatment, Monday through Friday. Each treatment takes 20 minutes and it typically goes on for six weeks. So um, sometimes we uh, have to be, you know, you really want to have that that frank conversation so that the patients understand what they're signing up for. Yes, they're 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 able to save their breast, but they will be going for a daily treatment. And sometimes, if there's mobility issues or the patients have other comorbidities, um, perhaps it's not as realistic. Very good. Um, so now I, you know, you had already talked about immunotherapy and some of these other exciting treatments, but there is um, something new in the biopsy uh, process that I want to ask you about, and that is the new technology called MagSeeds um, that make that a better process. Can you talk about that? Sure. So um, again, St. John's Riverside is really uh, great at keeping up with newer technologies and really helping uh, patients um, have a more convenient process. So what happens uh, in some centers and um, for some for some patients is the day that they need their breast surgery, 
if it is not something that we can feel in the breast, we need the radiologist to localize that area. And so traditionally, they, the radiologist would place a wire into the breast, um, it's a thin wire, um, it would go into the breast and locate, locate the abnormality, and that wire would then stick out through the skin. And it would stick out through the skin and get taped to the skin, and the patient um, would then come up to the operating room with this wire coming out of their breast. They'd have to get to the hospital a little bit earlier to have this procedure done, and then we, we use the wire to guide us to the site. So what MAGC does it, is it eliminates that wire. So you no longer have something external hanging out. You no longer are, are uh, forced to have the wire put in or that procedure done the same day as surgery. Um, MAGSEED is a um, very tiny uh, localizing like chip that's placed into the breast. It can be put in uh, weeks before the surgery happens. Um, when it's convenient for the patient to go for this appointment. It's a quick appointment. They can do it um, sometimes under ultrasound guidance, typically under mammogram. They place this uh, seed into the breast and the day of surgery, the patient can just come to the operating room. Uh, there's nothing external hanging out. And I uh, have an instrument that basically like a magnet can detect where that seed has been placed. And I use that to much more directly um, uh, predict what I need to remove. So the advantages are the convenience for the patients. Another advantage is I'm able to take out less tissue. So because they're localizing it so precisely, I'm not have, I'm not forced to take such a big area. I won't be leaving a defect in the breast. And lastly, I can place my incision wherever I want. So I prefer to hide my incision on the breast. I can place it around the areola or I can hide it underneath the breast. With MagSeed, I have the freedom to put my incision where I want. With the wire, you're sometimes uh, not able to do that. You're forced a little bit and sometimes have to make a cut on the breast, it, um, which is not a hidden scar and then isn't, isn't as uh, cosmetically appealing to somebody. Um, so, you know, I've actually came to the end of my questions, um, but what I, what I wanted to to just sort of put out there is, you know, we've all gone through COVID and we um, we recognize that many people in the community uh, sort of delayed getting testing, getting their annual physicals, their annual mammograms, their annual colonoscopies. Um, and I think that the message that we want to send, and I think that you need to concur, um, is early detection. So, it, you know, I know a lot of women who go and they get it, and then a year goes by, but they're like, ah, oh, I'll get it done, I'm busy now, and they wait a couple of months. That's really not advisable, right? The best thing to do is get out there, get it right. done. Right. I mean, we're so fortunate to have the technology to be able to screen for a very common disease, right? One in eight women will get breast cancer. And it's it's not, you know, something that we can't treat and it's not something that we can't cure if it's caught early. We have the ability to screen women every year uh, with a mammogram. The chances of catching something early are great with these mammograms. Um, it's inconvenient. It can be uncomfortable. Like Denise mentioned, the you know contoured plates are not as they're not flat. They're more um, curved, so they 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 naturally fit your breast a little bit better. Um, mammogram is pretty quick. Doesn't take that long, and it it really is just something that you know you go to the dentist and that's not enjoyable, and you have to get your mammogram and it's not that enjoyable, but. When it's done, you should just, before you leave that office, set yourself up for next year. Just, just as though anything else, right? Like you just put it in your calendar and every year, some people do it on their birthday, some people do it on the 1st of October, however you can remember to do it. Um, but it really, it really is uh, the most important thing. And there are so many cancers that we can't screen for, for and those patients don't um, have the same opportunity that our breast cancer patients have. You know, I just thought of something else. Um, we had talked earlier about, thank you for that. I think that was a great, that's a great PSA. I may cut that right out of there and put you on the radio. Um, the genetic risk is one 
reason people get breast cancer, but then people get breast cancer who don't have a genetic risk. So are there things that we're doing, eating, uh, hormones? What what else in our, is it environmental? What are the things that you're seeing that are, are triggering? Or maybe you don't know the answer to that. And, you know, I'm, I'm asking the big question here. Like, please let me not do any of the things you tell me and then I won't have it. Um, what well, are Laura, the other causes? Yeah, Laura, you can give some insight into that. Yeah, um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, topics out there that are, you know, still being, you know, researched. So some things we can't say for sure, but some things we do know are certainly keeping your weight under control, making sure you're getting enough exercise. These are all things that we can do to reduce our risk for breast cancer. Also, not smoking. So if you still smoke, making sure that you stop smoking, um, even if it you have a plan and you're working on it, it no, it, no time is too late to stop smoking and drinking less alcohol. Um, we do know based on clinical research that um, for females drinking two or more glasses of wine or any kind of alcohol per day significantly increases your risk for developing breast cancer during your lifetime. So limiting the amount of alcohol, limiting smoking, not smoking at all in fact, um, and making sure you're controlling your weight and getting enough exercise are the, the most important things that we can do to reduce our risk. And just to say, in terms of exercise, because sometimes, you know, our patients say, well, you know, what do you what do you mean? Define what you mean by exercise. So 30 minutes, three times a week of whether it's brisk walking or uh, using a bike, but just to get your heart rate up 30 minutes, three times a week um, really reduces the risk. And for our breast cancer survivors has been shown to decrease the risk of recurrence. That's very good. Um, what about hormones? Hormone replacement therapy? Uh, is there any connection with that? Actively taking hormone replacement therapy does increase the risk for hormone sensitive breast cancers um, in, in the postmenopausal setting specifically. Do you have any more information to add about that specifically, Dr. McAvoy? Sure. Sure. So, I mean, there's diff there's different, you know, types of hormone replacement therapy. So we're when we talk about increasing the risk, these are like oral estrogen pills that you're taking. And you may um, really be suffering and going through, you know, terrible symptoms from menopause, which should not just be dismissed. And I think you have to work with your, um, you know, GYN. We have excellent uh, providers here through St. John's who really want to connect with their patients and help them through this tough time. Um, but understanding that risk. So when we say you have a high risk of, uh, you know, it, it increases your risk greatly. Sometimes it can be quoted as high as 60%, but you have to realize that that's talking about going from a risk of about 7% to 11%. It doesn't mean you now have a 60% risk of getting breast cancer, right? Okay. It's increased your risk more than the average person, but, um, you have to decide what you're comfortable with and you know hormone replacement therapy to get you through you know a few months um i would say is okay based on how bad those symptoms are in quality of life very interesting um and this has come up a lot too but soy and because it has estrogen receptors i understand is that uh, an issue because it's in everything and it's everything we eat it's it's in everything so is that something that women should be or then men should be concerned about? Laura, you can answer. This is also another um, fairly debated topic in the breast cancer world. So um, there's conflicting research on both sides. We tend to say that that small amounts of soy should not be a problem. It shouldn't put you at risk. Um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that you're eating all soy all the time just because of that debate, right? But you know, some some research might show that it does increase your risk. And and yet in in Asian countries where individuals eat a lot of soy-based products, the breast cancer rates are low. So again, it's it's been sort of a debate, but uh, we can pretty much say that you know small amounts of soy should be safe uh, to consume. Okay, I, okay, I'm officially now out of questions. So, is there anything either of you would like to add, or something that we didn't cover? Because if you're if you're good, then we'll put up some information. Laura, anything else? Sure. No? I 
you know, yeah. I would just like to say, I mean, you know, um, I feel like the, the breast team is still a little bit new to St. John's. It's been a little bit over a year, um, but it really has been great to be a part of this community. I'm grateful everyone's welcomed us so nicely into St. John's. We, we love being a part of the team here. Um, we love having you. But for, you know, for patients to know, and even just for, for primary care doctors, it can be overwhelming to, to understand what the mammogram is suggesting. Am I coming back in six months? The patient feels something, the mammogram says there's nothing. Send the patients to us. We're happy to take that off of you. We can take on the responsibility of following up the mammograms for you. We're doing a, a, a breast exam on the patients and helping reassure them and perhaps even reassuring you um, and, and, and helping work things up. So if you question something, don't feel as though you need to take on all of the onus and, and work it up yourselves. We're happy to see a patient and help get them worked up for you. That's wonderful. And we appreciate you both. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, before we say goodbye to our audience, though, I think we have some information that we would like to put up. And there it goes. So if you would like to make an appointment with either Dr. McAvoy or Laura Grafland, please um, call 914-849-0100. That information is also available on our website under our physician directory. So feel free to uh, look them up or send me an email at info at riversidehealth.org and we will get that information out to you. Uh, for those patients who are still concerned about coming out and getting care, or if there's any issues that you're facing out in the world, uh, please remember that we do offer virtual urgent care and that number is 914-964-4429. And uh, we're happy to uh, see you that way. Again, general questions, info at riversidehealth.org, physician referral, find a doc at riversidehealth.org, and uh, that physician referral number is 964-4DOC or 964-4362. Um, please call us, please send us emails. Uh, we love to help our, our uh, community and uh, we thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, ladies. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks. Leo.